and I'm very happy that we are having uh, Mariam Magani tonight with us because she is uh, the main uh, figure uh, and she uh, initiated this event. Uh, Mariam has um, been studying Afghan film for quite a long time and more specifically unfinished, uncompleted films that she's in interested in and there are many reasons for that. Uh, one thing was because those films um, uh, were started in a, a certain political situation uh, and it's very interesting to see whether they can be completed now in a completely different situation and to see why those films were not completed and all these things are related to the history of Afghanistan, the Soviet influence and many other factors. That's why uh, it was very interesting for us to bring her here and uh, just uh, to ask her to share her comments, her ideas, and how we could perhaps help her research. We hope that um, in 2017 uh, um, we will uh, um, make a film um, uh, and uh, um, um, it will include all sorts of research that he has carried out uh, throughout the years. And now I would like to give the floor to Katya. Thank you, Snezhana. Thank you, everyone. I'd love to thank uh, all the people that came here and uh, all the guests. I'd love to say a few more words about Mariam Ghani. It's true that uh, uh, she initiated this uh, talk tonight. She's an artist, uh, um, a writer, a researcher. She studies archives. She finds some rare films that uh, have never uh, been finished. And so this uh, evening is going to be part of her research. We are going to see three films. I'll tell you later about them. And we're going to discuss these films uh, just um, um, uh, while we watch them. And uh, we are having other participants in these discussions. We are having three guests and also some other guests uh, um, who are among this audience tonight. And uh, I'd love to introduce Gennady Avdeev, who is a diplomat, professor, uh, and um, he has PhD in Middle Eastern studies. Uh, he uh, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and some other Middle East uh, countries. Uh, she Oh, sorry, he worked uh, at the uh, House of Soviet uh, uh, Culture and Technology. He was working at the Society of Soviet Afghan Friendship, and uh, he also worked at the Union of Soviet Friendship Societies and Cultural Relations with foreign countries in his department of the Near and Middle East. We are also having his wife, Lyudmila Avdeeva, who was working in Afghanistan. She was a journalist. And um, she was uh, there during that time. She can tell us a, a lot about culture of uh, Afghanistan. Then Alexander Markov, who is a documentary filmmaker, he um, works with Soviet films, African films, uh, um, archives. Uh, he made some films based on very rare archival material. So um, I hope that uh, he will help us uh, um, um, to analyze Afghan films that we're going to see tonight and maybe compare the films that we had here in the Soviet Union and other countries. I'm Katya Biloglazova. I'm a manager and working here at the Garage Museum. I'm going to be a moderator. So now we're going to see a first film, which is going to be about April Revolution, 1978. And I guess um, uh, I'll give the floor to Mariam because I want her to um, present this film. And then after this film, we'll uh, see um, two more films, one dated 1986 and the other one 1984. So the first film is uh, a reenactment. It's not a um, mockumentary. It's very interesting that this is a reconstruction of uh, April Revolution 1978, where those people 
that initiated that revolution participated and uh, Mariam will tell you more about it later and then uh, we'll see a film uh, uh, fall that was made in 1986 and it's very special uh, because we can see the atmosphere of tension uh, lack of trust uh, um, and surveillance that uh, I guess could be felt in political and cultural life of that period and then the third film is called Black Diamond and the main character of this film uh, um, um, got into the smugglers uh, uh, crew and um, uh, it's not quite clear what they do apart from um, uh, smuggling diamonds and weapons uh, uh, so some parts of this film were lost uh, so um, we're not sure about motives and some turns of the story but uh, we'll hope we'll be able to make comments while we watch uh, and we welcome your participation so thank you very much Mariam the floor is yours if you could tell us more about your project and the first film. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the project as a whole, uh, what we left unfinished uh, is uh, research into uh, these five unfinished feature films from this per particular period in Afghan history, which is uh, the period of both Afghan communism and the Soviet influence in Afghanistan, 1978 to 1991-92. Uh, and uh, what we're watching tonight are the first three films um, from you know these five films that I'm investigating. Uh, and specifically what we're watching are uh, scenes that I've cut together from the uh, silent rush prints uh, of these films. So these are the, the dailies uh, that were printed at the end of filming each day so that the filmmakers could sort of check how the filming went. Uh, and um, because they're silent, we will use that as an opportunity to basically do a running commentary uh, as we're watching and, you know, both like look at the, the filmmaking, some qualities of the filmmaking and uh, help to kind of decode some of the politics that were encoded into these films at the time. Because, you know, as you as you know, um, uh, filmmakers uh, working in, in this period uh, couldn't always be explicit uh, about their themes um, uh, as they were making these films. Um, I also want you to, to kind of think about um, these films which were you know each cancelled for a different reason um, as sort of like failed propaganda. Uh, you know, because they were cancelled they, they didn't necessarily succeed in expressing uh, the desires of the, the Afghan communist state in the same way that films that were finished did. And that's one of the reasons I think they're particularly interesting to look at um, as these, you know, sort of failures uh, of, uh, of expressions of the desires of the state. They, they, you know, they're sort of, they're, they both express those wishes in a way and also, you know, fail to express them. They also subvert them in, in different ways. So we'll try to look at both, you know, how they encapsulate the moment in which they were made and how they somehow fail to do so. Uh, so we'll start with the April Revolution, um, which is, uh, we can go ahead and cue the tape. Okay. So uh, Inkilabi Sor, or the Re April Revolution, uh, was made by a group of um, uh, filmmakers who were um, commissioned by the uh, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, um, the Afghan Communist Party, which had taken power three months earlier in um, the, uh, the coup of um, April 1978. Uh, and there was very little actual documentation of that coup d'etat because it was a almost entirely unplanned uh, revolution. Uh, it, it was uh, basically a, a coup d'etat that happened um, uh, as a result of an emergency plan made at the um, uh, meeting of the party congress, the, the PDPA congress, uh, several months earlier. Uh, where the leaders had said, um, if, if we are all arrested, uh, then our sort of secret members in the army should launch a coup d'etat, but they didn't really think that would happen. Uh, 
Um, they didn't really think they would all be arrested within the next year. Uh, and in fact, it happened not very long afterwards. Uh, and then suddenly the coup d'etat happened. And then they were in power with not a great idea necessarily of what to do with it. Um, so uh, this film actually opens um, with a series of scenes that are meant to establish uh, life in Kabul before, before the communist revolution. Uh, and these are these scenes which are s sort of showing the gap between uh, this kind of Western influenced bourgeoisie um, and uh, the, um, the people uh, living in the proletariat. Um, uh, in in uh, this is actually um, uh, I believe it's the it's near the Koshai uh, Kharabat uh, the the street of musicians. Um, yeah. Mm. I would like to say that this film is really interesting for me because it covers a long period of the war in Afghanistan where the Soviet Union participated and uh, more than 13,000 soldiers died and uh, um, uh, two and a half years that we spent in Kabul uh, we witnessed all those military actions that war and as a journalist as a writer I wrote a lot about that and I can say that this uh, revolution I could actually argue with her um, with you. It was not planned. Uh, when Piraki was the president, uh, when he came to the Soviet Union, he um, said many times, uh, he asked the government, the Soviet government many times to establish the democratic power in his country. So when uh, this uh, revolution took place in 1978, despite that uh, our um, uh, scholars, our uh, study, uh, scientists uh, um, were not sure they wanted to investigate the situation because they knew um, how resistant Afghan people could be uh, during um, uh, British Empire time. So it was a very com uh, complex solution. Uh, but in 1979, uh, the Soviet Union decided to uh, send their troops into the uh, 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 in Afghanistan. And now, while watching this film, I can say that uh, it is uh, staged, it is a feature film, but also I can say lots of documentary footage um, used here. For example, we saw Kabul at the beginning, which is the capital of Afghanistan. We saw uh, some uh, workers' um, um, neighborhoods, and it's true. This uh, city um, was like a medieval city, uh, lots of poverty, 90% uh, of people were illiterate. And uh, despite that, um, uh, during the Soviet Union, we had very good friendly relationships uh, with Afghanistan. We uh, gave them uh, humanitarian, political, and economic uh, um, help. We built industrial facilities, scientific facilities, for example, a polytechnical institute, medical institute. So thousands of Afghan people studied in uh, our education institutions. Then you saw some hotels. Uh, um, there were some swimming pools uh, near those hotels. You saw the embankment. You saw how um, they baked uh, bread. And now we um, can see documentary footage um, because um, this is all related to military actions. And I guess my husband could tell you more about that. We can see some footage here um, that uh, is full of tension. The military men that were very progressive and educated part of Afghan society, and they decided to uh, rebel against the regime and they decided to um, use the weapon that they had to topple that regime. And we can see some pilots, tank um, um, officers. And um, the first shot on the president's palace it used to be a king's palace. So it was the tanks that made that short, the first shot. And so they started the revolution. 
It's true that this film is trying to provide social and political explanation and describe the situation. Yes, it's true, we saw some poor neighborhoods, the guys um, who uh, was carrying water, you know probably that it's very difficult, uh, um, there's a very difficult situation with portable water in Kabul, and um, uh, then the layout of the city itself uh, was quite clear, sh clearly shown here, because, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, some parts of the city are located um, uh, on the highland, so it's, it was very difficult to transport water up there. So uh, small children usually uh, brought water there. And um, that's a good background for uh, um, uh, which is good to see how this uh, uh, military coup d'etat developed. I would like to say that uh, the old uh, parts of Kabul uh, looked like nests uh, um, on, on a hill and uh, it's true, it's very difficult to transport water there. And now we can see some uh, uh, war scenes. Uh, we had um, uh, our army in Kabul and uh, in the outskirts nearby. And you probably know that um, we wanted to uh, provide international aid uh, when we went there. And this is the palace, the king's palace. That's what it looked like inside. And uh, so now it is big being seized. Amin uh, was a ruler. Amin was related to the West. And uh, the um, uh, members of PDPA um, um, asked um, um, the Soviet government uh, to help because it was a very difficult situation. Lots of contradictions, ideological, political, and many other contradictions. And so um, that's what we have just seen. Amin was arrested and the uh, palace uh, uh, was seized. Uh, would you like to comment on that, Mariam? Because you were collecting a lot of information about this film. Perhaps you could make a um, comment. Mm -hmm. Well, so this film was commissioned basically three months after the coup d'etat. So this is done in the period uh, before the party split into two factions. This is when uh, the two factions of the PDPA, the Khalkis and the Parchamis, were still more or less united uh, uh, under the leadership of Nur Muhammad uh, Taraki. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, uh, so the, the moment when this film was made um, was uh, a moment when uh, the the regime was still this kind of Afghan communist regime in the sort of first blush of the of the of the April Revolution, and it was celebrating that moment. Uh, by the time uh, the film, you know, had been processed uh, or had been sent to uh, Uzbekistan for for color processing. Um, the two factions of the party had split, uh, and uh, the uh, Khalkis had exiled the Partamis uh, uh, to various Soviet republics. Uh, and um, uh, uh, by the time uh, that uh, the uh, filmmakers were thinking about actually editing the film and trying to get the footage back uh, and uh, doing various things with it, uh, trying to actually think about finishing it, um, by then uh, the uh, um, Amin Hafizullah Amin, uh, 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 Taraki's deputy, had assassinated Taraki, uh, had taken over, had started to distance himself in various ways from um, his uh, Soviet patrons, uh, which had made the Soviets rather nervous. Uh, and then the the, the um, uh, uh, infamous overnight uh, invasion of Kabul took place. There's a good story about that, which may be apocryphal, which is that, you know, the cooks in the Tajbeg palace were Soviet, and they drugged the soup at the lunchtime meeting of the Afghan Politburo. Uh, and so the entire Politburo slept through the invasion that night. They slept through the Spetsnaz uh, invasion. I don't know if that's actually true, but I have heard that story from several different people. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so what happened was that uh, the Parchamis came back with, uh, with the invasion and uh, they canceled the film. So that is why that particular film never got finished uh, because it became part of um, uh, 
Uh, in many ways, it, it was a film in, in the footage that we've lost that we, we, we don't have to show you today. But in that, in that footage, it, you see sort of Hafizullah Amin's moment of glory when he uh, passes the crucial message uh, to the army um, to uh, to start the coup d'etat, and uh, it, it so uh, in this kind of it it, f it the film sort of fell into um, uh, the uh, the the moment that happened after uh, the invasion when uh, Hafizullah Amin's myth. Uh, his sort of auto myth-making project became very much deprecated. Um, and instead, there was uh, actually a week of, a national week of mourning for all the victims of Amin. Uh, that's how much uh, Amin was actually hated. Uh, and then his whole myth was turned on its head after, after the, the invasion of 1979. Uh, so this film sort of fell, fell into that. Uh, uh, overturning of the myth of Amin, and it, it was never finished for that reason. We are going to see uh, some um, other films, and we can see that Afghan filmmakers didn't really make their films in studios. We know this methodology. Uh, it appeared in the 30s when you just uh, um, use the uh, natural settings, uh, adding a little bit. So this uh, realism comes from the place. And that's why there is, uh, you trust uh, what you see. It's phenomenal that you have this trust. And then in the next film, we'll see the influence of Indian Calcutta school and uh, one of the uh, major uh, filmmakers, Chitirei. And uh, it's true, um, uh, Afghan filmmakers uh, um, learned a lot from Indian filmmakers, some of them uh, studied in Moscow. So it's a phenomenal uh, feature because there are no settings. And that's why you feel this influence of documentary film. It's very powerful. And we can say that uh, it was a unique situation. Um, I guess um, Afghan filmmakers just uh, couldn't uh, uh, afford uh, studio uh, shootage, uh, but you'll see it later. Let's start the next film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I would like to um, make one comment, just to make things clear, so that we could understand the historical dynamics of um, uh, our revolution. What we have seen was the actions themselves by army people who initiated uh, our rev revolution. The um, Soviet army was not there. Uh, near Kabul. It was the time uh, when this our revolution uh, started. And then a year later, uh, there uh, were the reasons for uh, the um, split in the party and uh, uh, fighting between uh, the two fractions. So this part of film uh, was about Afghan participants uh, of Saur Revolution. And I wanted to add that during uh, that revolution, many documentary films appeared because both um, our uh, film directors went there who wanted to um, uh, help and uh, develop uh, filmmakers in Afghanistan. Uh, there were lots of cultural events. I could. Uh, 
recommend uh, uh, to read uh, some books. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so volume 11 and volume 15 uh, uh, tells uh, the readers about that life in Afghanistan. So, and uh, there were many people who witnessed uh, those events and um, uh, give their testimonies, uh, uh, and um, including uh, members of Afghan uh, diaspora. And uh, I remember that the first president of Afghanistan was a very good person. He was a writer. He left many uh, literally uh, books, and the last Najibullah was a very nice person as well. He was a, a doctor. Uh, he was um, uh, executed, and Teraki uh, was um, uh, uh, suffocated by Amin. So uh, uh, I, I think Mariam has done a great work. Uh, she has done huge research work that uh, could become a source for large-scale research. So I would like to wish her all the best because it is so complicated. Mariam, could you please introduce the second film? Okay, yes. Yeah, so the, the second film we're watching uh, is called uh, Sokut, um, and, uh, which means uh, fall or, or falling. And um, uh, it was directed by Fakir Nabi, who is better known as an actor. Um, uh, he was uh, the star uh, of a, a film called Akhtar i Mascara, Akhtar the Joker. Um, uh, which uh, was directed by uh, Latif Ahmadi, uh, and he's probably best known in Afghan cinema for that, for, for starring in Akhtari Mascara. Uh, and he's still active as an actor today. But this would have been his first film as a director. Um, you actually, that's him, that's Fakir Nabi uh, on, the, on the top left, uh, in, the, in the striped sweater there, making a cameo in his film. Um, and uh, this, this is a film um, uh, about uh, 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 the hero of this film uh, is an agent uh, in uh, Khad, um, the state security agency. Uh, this film was uh, shot in 1986. Uh, and in 1986, uh, Khad, which had been mentored by the Stasi, um, had um, uh, something like, the records are not very accessible, but we think something like 20,000 people working for it. Um, and uh, many of them were not uh, employees on the books, but sort of um, informants embedded secretly in many different departments of government and companies. Um, uh, you know, in the same way that the Stasi sort of operated. Uh, so this film is in, in many ways, uh, although it presents itself as a story about uh, a cop uh, who goes undercover in a criminal gang, um, uh, in many ways it is m much more a story about, um, you know, people who are watching other people who are watching other people who are watching other people, um, and about this kind of spiral of paranoia that you enter into in a society under surveillance. Um, yeah, so this initial scene is really the scene that establishes um, the hero as someone who works for Khad. It's never explicitly said in the film that that's what the agency he works for, but because you see him in this initial scene stopping a car bomb, um, that's how you know he works for Khad because that's the job that a Khad agent would do. Um, yeah. Может быть, Александр, если вы готовы прокомментировать уже по Александр, perhaps you also could make a comment. Честно говоря, вот таких uh, I guess I can't really think about any uh, comparisons with Soviet film uh, or maybe those films that I saw when I was a child, Zlata Amin, a Golden Mine by Leningrad uh, film director Tatarsky. Oleg Dal was the actor who starred in that film. 
So this film was about thieves, about smugglers who could have some whiskey and smoke cigars. So this uh, uh, could be seen in Soviet detective uh, films uh, very often. But I guess it was a comic view of uh, uh, the Western life. So who could afford this? Only thieves and maybe the sailors and KGB people, uh, those people that uh, uh, work abroad. Uh, so I guess uh, this what I, uh, it reminded me of uh, uh, this access to some uh, Western things, uh, and uh, I can feel some dissonance here. Then another thing is that this film, this um, scenes remind me of uh, uh, perestroika films when um, the film directors uh, during perestroika time. Uh, um, could uh, breathe some fresh air, uh, they could uh, get some funding, and it was the same with Afghan uh, films. So this inability to work in the studio uh, can uh, give great results, because uh, you have to work with real streets, with real houses, and this uh, um, uh, generates trust. I'd love to add that, uh, of course, uh, this film has just several episodes, and uh, then every person could um, make a story based on these uh, scenes. But I can see that some moral issues uh, are raised here, and you know, these moral ideals of good and evil evil, this chain reaction of uh, informing, of uh, chasing, following, uh, can be easily seen. Yes, uh, um, uh, we can, could see some drugs uh, in the car, some family drama, uh, but uh, it's really difficult to um, uh, find out uh, uh, what the script uh, was like, what uh, um, uh, the film director wanted to make and um, uh, how this film uh, looked like. Uh, my question is for Gennady. So, surveillance, special um, agents, uh, spying. Do you remember these things? For example, uh, can you say that one neighbor uh, uh, you know, was suspicious of uh, the person who lived uh, next to him. So these uh, uh, criminal motives, uh, uh, were they uh, uh, felt uh, in Afghanistan? Well, uh, I um, heard uh, uh, this um, comment uh, related to HUD and uh, Stasi uh, was an uh, um, uh, intelligence service of uh, German, German Democratic Republic, and it was highly professional. But uh, actually, they used uh, Soviet advisors uh, that worked uh, for the military um, organizations and the uh, HUD, the secret organization. So you used uh, 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 informants uh, reporting on each other. Maybe the, uh, these uh, uh, words were taken from Soviet reality because uh, this was um, a spread phenomenon uh, in uh, the Soviet uh, republics. So, speaking about uh, socialist uh, Soviet uh, um, uh, context, yes, uh, the, um, this was uh, very common. But in Afghanistan, it wasn't like that. All this job uh, was done by enforcement uh, uh, organizations like HUD and others. So, they didn't really um, spy on. Uh, uh, 
people, on common people. They um, only spied on those people that could be dangerous, that uh, were a big threat, who, for example, could set up some uh, uh, groups um, of resistance, uh, who uh, were trying uh, to hide in some authorities. So, um, you know, there uh, was a lot of work done in order to uh, ruin uh, uh, the um, authorities. So, uh, by the um, 80s, it was clear that uh, they couldn't fight against counter-revolutionaries uh, themselves. And that's why Taraki asked Brezhnev to help. So that um, uh, a lot of uh, aid could provide it to Afghan government to make sure uh, everything uh, was okay. My question is for all uh, discussion participants. So where's the borderline here? Like whether this story was just an entertaining story or it has some clues? Well. Uh, I think, you know, the story was meant to function as uh, an entertaining cops and robbers story, uh, but it was a failure at that, uh, obviously because it was cancelled, <laughs> um, so it didn't succeed on the entertainment level for that reason, because it never made it to, to an audience. Um, and maybe it could have succeeded as entertainment if it had made it to an audience. I, I'm not sure. But I think the political content in some ways really overwhelmed like the, the sort of uh, pure entertainment content. And I think that's where the, the censorship of this film, uh, you know, it really was canceled for political reasons, um, unlike some of the other unfinished films I've been looking at, this one really was canceled for political reasons. Um, and I think it's because that balance really ended up quite far on the political side. Um, and uh, maybe it's because it, uh, Fakir Nabi was a first time filmmaker and he wasn't as experienced at hiding, hiding the content of the political content of the film at making it very coded. Um, and it, it's all, it's much too much on the surface. Um, so for so, example, we were... Concretely, да, могло uh, what uh, were uh, the main things for censors? Um, so uh, censorship usually happened at the script stage. So uh, during these years, every script had to be passed by a board. Um, and um, the board had both officials from uh, the Ministry of uh, Information and Culture. Um, and also it had um, uh, like uh, actors and directors on it. So the board actually passed scripts both for for uh, content and for quality. So I, I've been told by people who served on the board um, that they would, send, they would send scripts back because they were too explicitly political, because they had um, themes that were uh, forbidden. Uh, religion was a forbidden theme, for example. Um, you couldn't make films that were uh, like explicitly about the war. They could have sort of like sub themes about the war. There's there's a film called Ashes, um, Khakistar, um, that um, uh, where the main plot of the film uh, is about a, um, a family man who uh, loses his his leg uh, in a kind of random street bombing. Um, uh, but that's just the inciting incident, and the rest of the film is about how he gets addicted to heroin for pain management, um, because he has pain from his phantom limb, um, and then he ends up getting addicted to heroin. So that's the main plot of the film, and the the sort of random like violence at the beginning of the film is like just like a teeny tiny part, so it passed the censor. Um, uh, but the censor, uh, the script censoring board would actually sometimes also send scripts back because they thought they just weren't good enough. 
Um, and they were like, you need to write like a second and maybe also a third draft of this script because it's just like really kind of crappy. Um, like that, that also happened. Да, но вопрос был про то конкретно в этом. Uh, вопрос был про то конкретно в этом. But, uh, uh, what, uh, census, uh, uh, okay, there's two things. One is all the scenes of um, people following each other with telephoto lens, telephoto lens cameras. Um, and uh, the other is the fact that so much of it takes place around the Mikorayan building. Um, so um, uh, the Mikorayan building uh, is um, uh, a series, it's like a series of uh, apartment blocks, um, which are, you know, you're all familiar with like Mikorayan, like, uh, uh, which is actually like a term borrowed from here. Uh, in Kabul, the Mikorayan quarter is uh, like the only quarter of the city that looks like a Mikorayan. Um, and so it's just called like the Mikorayan district. Um, and it was also, it was built with uh, Soviet funding in the 1950s. Um, and um, uh, in uh, this period, in the 1980s, um, uh, the Mikrayan was uh, uh, notorious for, there were two blocks of the Mikrayan where most of like the government officials, it was, it was mostly inhabited by government officials, by party, party members. But there was this very funny thing where like the two factions of the party lived in a, like a, opposing blocks, like blocks that were across the street from each other. Um, so the Khalkis lived on one side and the Parchamis lived on the other side. And they kind of spied on each other, like across, across the blocks. Um, and their kids um, had, like, had little gangs that fought with each other between the blocks. Um, <laughs> like, so the Mikrayan is also like a big kind of cue in this film um, that it's, that it's not about cops and robbers, but it's actually about, it's about the party. <laughs> like, yeah. Просто да, вот у нас-то в Советском Союзе такая огромная that's uh, true about Soviet Union. We have a very rich tradition of censorship uh, that uh, ruined so many uh, destinies of so many talented uh, film directors. And uh, I remember Soviet film. Uh, it's a, uh, a Lithuanian film. Uh, made um, uh, following um, Julius Herrera, um, the president from Tanzania Commission, and uh, um, it was uh, Rim Tausen, um, Shutas and Victor Staroshes who um, made uh, that film. And when they edited this film and showed it to the ministry in Tanzania, uh, they were told to remove all the women wearing trousers because uh, and the African women can never wear trousers. They have to wear traditional clothes. So then they said, you have to remove all the white people from the film because you shouldn't remind our audience about colonialism. So that's a fact, uh, you know, uh, censorship from a uh, ministry in Tanzania. <coughs> I'd love to mention that this film was not um, thought through carefully. For example, speaking about cast casting, you know, uh, the cast uh, doesn't match the reality that existed during the, that period. I can say that uh, uh, throughout the decade of the communist regime, when this film was made, uh, the state authorities uh, and uh, secret services were full of young people. And so these young people served uh, uh, there, and they were enthusiastic uh, about the ideals of uh, this uh, communist revolution. They were full of optimism and excitement. And, uh, but we can see here like middle-aged people, uh, and uh, they 
Ukraine, любви к этому режиму. Я не думаю, что вот эти... I'm not passionate about this regime. I don't think they could be, you know, these agents of changes uh, and transform uh, the country uh, into a better place. I don't know uh, why we see so much of a collective here. I guess uh, this film director didn't really uh, know how to make films. And uh, I guess uh, speaking about the literary uh, basis, uh, it's very poor. Uh, we can see some beautiful girls. Uh, uh, maybe we, uh, I guess they are, might, might be involved in some investigations as well, but I don't think that this film is interesting. I'd love to say that uh, maybe this film uh, does not have very high artistic value. You know, it uh, probably can't be shown at the film festivals, uh, it can't be uh, shown internationally, but there is some context in this film. Maybe it's an ideological context. Uh, well, we can see a silent film, so we don't really know what it's about, but uh, we can see some um, gestures, some mimics, and I guess uh, these uh, dialogues have some serious foundation. Maybe they are related to some historical events that took place during those years. Uh, maybe the uh, film uh, director um, wanted not just to um, give some entertainment, but also to uh, show what happened in that country. It's not easy to judge um, uh, just based on these uh, few episodes. Uh, it's true that these people are uh, sort of mature, whereas um, the revolution uh, was uh, carried out by young people, because young people are full of enthusiasm, are full of energy, but uh, um, usually people uh, who are cynical um, uh, likes to um, reap the fruit of revolution. I can see that there are some questions um, from the audience, so please raise your hand and I'll try you know, to give you a microphone. I got the feeling that probably the problem uh, in this film is a product placement, mm -hmm. because there were a lot of uh, uh, um, links to the uh, uh, European or Western kind of life, Toyota, Nikon, and so on, the alcoholic uh, beverages. This is uh, this uh, this kind of things were clo were closely uh, associated with uh, the West, not the communist re uh, religion uh, regime. Yeah, so uh, as and, Alexander said earlier, and, like and that's often uh, in Afghan films, that's often a signifier of criminality. Yeah. Um, so, like, criminality or immorality, like when there's a lot of indulgence in uh, alcohol, especially, like, that's, that's often, like, used as a marker of criminality or immorality. Yeah. And uh, the also I have the feeling probably I'm not uh, I'm not correct, uh, but uh, tennis uh, is a for example is very as a golf was mm -hmm. as something like as a golf in Indian uh, mm -hmm. society in the Indian society. Mm -hmm. It's also then probably a marker of previous uh, golden age mm -hmm. of Afghan uh, society. Mm -hmm. That's what I I got from this uh, film. Yeah, it's it's definitely associated with that sort of Dawood era, yeah. kind of privileged yeah. class of the Dawood era. And yeah. um, also, uh, it recalls um, a, a legend about the death of Ahmad Zahir, who died in the uh, in the crash, mm -hmm. and he was a kind of a golden boy, probably mm -hmm. the golden boy, mm -hmm. uh, voice, and he was a kind of icon, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and he was very popular, and he also uh, probably uh, were, uh, uh, there was a legend, as I suppose, that he was in love with the daughter of the prime minister, or something like that. It's a kind of folk story, but it is. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's you know it's it's an it's a it's a it's a legend i don't know yeah, if yeah, it's yes it's of course a legend but uh <laughs> i've heard this legend uh once the my uh my <laughs> afghan friends told me that the problem the reason was that mm. <laughs> and he was considered as a kind of um uh, po uh culture hero mm. a pop culture hero mm. hero right um <laughs> yeah i I'm not sure of the relevance, but um, yeah, uh, I do want to say uh, in relation to the the actors. Um, so the the community around Afghan filmmaking during these years is very small. Uh, so it, there's there's like actually a significant amount of danger involved <laughs> in in making films during this period. Um, the filmmakers are quite identified with the regime and um, by this point, by like 86, 87, uh, Mujahideen were regularly attacking film sets. Um, whenever uh, the, the films were being shot outside of Kabul proper, uh, they would almost always be attacked by Mujahideen. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really small set of people who loved filmmaking enough to keep making films during this time. And most of them were people who were already making films like in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Um, so uh, the actors are also a very small group. Uh, it's all the same actors in most of the films from this period. Um, yeah, it's it's there. There isn't a large a large pool of people to draw on when you're casting a film in Afghanistan in 1986. It's like maximum 20 people. Hmm. Короткий комментарий от Александра, mm -hmm. и потом я уже вижу, есть два комментария из зала. Mm -hmm. Сразу? Нет? Ну, я просто, yeah. да, извините, я просто быстро скажу, потому что на самом деле вот кино, оно... Э if um, you remember um, the French New Wave or Soviet uh, film of Khrushchev time, we had similar processes. Uh, despite that um, the um, uh, society was more democratic, but um, uh, uh, film responses very um, uh, subtly to many things. For example, when um, we began to talk about corruption, it was after Perestroika, and uh, we can see a similar film here. I'm not going to judge about its quality, but the topic is the same, because we had the same in this country. So, uh, you know, after Perestroika, uh, there was no censorship, and uh, it was very difficult to understand who is fighting who. It's, uh, it was not clear what happened in KGB, and it was reflected in uh, uh, films during Perestroika. And we see the same uh, rhythm here, the same phenomenon. We are having tonight Vladimir Boyko, who uh, is, is a uh, historical uh, uh, scientist who works at the Institute of Oriental Studies. Thank you very much. I spent six years at the Institute of Oriental Studies. I um, uh, loved my professors, and uh, now I'm uh, uh, the head of the expert center at Altai State University. I'm very interested in this screening and in this discussion. I'm uh, impressed uh, by the terms you use. Uh, well, uh, you know, as to communist uh, regime, it was uh, Karmal. Uh, um, in, 1980, uh, in 1948, when he had an argument, uh, uh, but this was the only event. Uh, you're just using the same cliche that Mujahideens use. Uh, 
because this uh, invites criticism. You know, it was um, a democratic regime or some other kind of regime, but it cannot be called a communist uh, regime. Maybe some ideas were communist in uh, essence, like Taraki had, but we shouldn't use um, um, uh, the term communist regime uh, with regards to Afghanistan. Uh, I was uh, working on the Afghan topic for a long time, and I used um, a lot of documents from the archive of uh, uh, film documents. So I could see different episodes, uh, how Mullah Khan uh, behaved, uh, like uh, how uh, regular people behaved. Um, then uh, if you uh, check YouTube, you'll see um, uh, dozens of um, Afghan uh, films, uh, beautiful documentary films about Zahir Shah. Maybe uh, they are a little bit too uh, formal uh, because uh, there is some propaganda, but uh, they are very good. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, was uh, uh, coup d'etat, but it was, uh, um, uh, you know, it was now, it's considered to be a, a very um, uh, uh, productive event, uh, and um, he uh, was, um, the leader was very despotic, and uh, uh, the people tried to save themselves, and then only later the term revolution appeared. Of course, there are very few documentary episodes, uh, because it was uh, unexpected for the uh, government. I liked this last film. It's not worse than Soviet films, including the cast. It's it all uh, looked quite real. I don't. I think Lyubov Arlova, the Russian actor, was much worse. Uh, and uh, earliest um, Soviet films uh, were not any better. Of course, it's uh, it's a close world here, but we can see so many passions. Of course, uh, uh, professionals were involved in spying. Uh, there was a lot of uh, distrust uh, between uh, different groups. So, uh, yes, maybe uh, some of those uh, things uh, look ugly, uh, but I think uh, it's uh, quite good. Of course, it won't win any festival, but, uh, you know, it's like a sketch. And we should uh, work a lot uh, to recreate what happened, because uh, Afghanistan doesn't have uh, modern history. Uh, you know, uh, there was an Academy of Science uh, during uh, Taliban's uh, um, uh, government, and uh, the same as Mutahi. Only heroic uh, uh, stories um, of the 18th century uh, were studied. So it's very difficult uh, uh, to uh, find the history of Afghanistan because there are many, many historical uh, um, events uh, related to the um, Saudi re Revolution and uh, many Afghan um, uh, scientists. Uh, uh, study uh, these events. Uh, there's a book, uh, The Power of Opposition in Afghanistan, that has been translated in different languages. So we should welcome all these efforts because film is a very important genre. Mm. Because this is the language of that um, period. So, uh, historians, uh, uh, culturologists uh, like uh, Mariam Ghani should get together. And I'm very happy that. Uh, 
uh, we see um, this uh, rising because uh, uh, it's true that uh, there are young people that uh, became deputy ministers uh, like 20 or 30 year olds and they can do a lot of things of course there's some foreign interference there for um, Mullah is considered to be a hero, but uh, everybody knows that uh, he was always trading. Uh, he was uh, uh, trying to uh, cancel uh, Soviet Afghan agreement and sign uh, an agreement with uh, the British. And uh, uh, when he was dethroned, he um, applied for appealed uh, um, for help uh, to the uh, Great Britain. So this country is special in terms of its geopolitical situation. So many ethnic groups uh, had uh, to do the same. Uh, sometimes it's considered a betrayal, but it's not true. Afghan people uh, have some share of responsibility, and this film is part of contribution that the Afghan people um, have uh, for the uh, restoration and revival of their culture. Now I would like to give the floor to Vladislav Kaverin, who is a researcher and studies uh, Afghan culture. I'd love to uh, say that um, the second film uh, should be uh, looked uh, like, an, um, you know, uh, like from the Indian film's point of view. I quite liked uh, it, um, just seeing these images without any sound, just like uh, uh, the film with Victor Tsui, uh, I think uh, the people uh, here, Afghan people, didn't play anything. They just were themselves. They didn't have to portray anything. Uh, yes, you mentioned this uh, dissonance that uh, people were a little bit old for their roles. Maybe they should have um, chosen younger ones. But I wanted to ask you uh, about the social structure of actors. Were they proletariats or some noblemen? Uh, and where they studied? Um, I'm interested in both actors and film directors. I understand that some of them studied here in the Soviet Union, but maybe they also studied in some other countries. So social structure and education. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, impressed uh, uh, by your comments about age. You know, this is the um, tradition of Amer American uh, film, because uh, when I see some old films, I can see mature people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, the... Uh, the filmmakers um, uh, of these films, there's a bit of a mix. Uh, some of them um, are uh, the film we're going to look at next, um, uh, Alma Cecia, uh, was directed by uh, Khaled Khalil, who's from an older generation of um, Afghan filmmakers who are <coughs> largely self taught. Um, there, uh, when Afghan Films was first started in 1968, um, this is like the, the National Film Institute, Afghan Films, um, uh, there was a, a cameraman um, named Talwar who came up from India uh, and trained a group of uh, cinematographers, uh, Afghan cinematographers, and they became the first group of directors in Afghanistan. Um, this was in the early 60s, uh, and that's you know how Afghan films was started. So Khaled Khalil was among this first group. Um, the um, the cameraman of uh, Inkilab Isar, um, the April Revolution, um, uh, engineer Latif is also among this group. Uh, he he also studied at the Polytechnic University, but uh, he actually studied engineering there. Um, he's he's from a working class background. Uh, uh, Latif um, Ahmadi, uh, his first film actually, the sculptures are laughing. Um, which is a really fantastic, weird film, um, as you might guess from the title. Uh, it's um, it's sort of 
auto, semi-autobiographical. Uh, it's the story of an artist who falls in love with a rich girl. Um, and uh, uh, the rich girl, of course, like disdains this poor artist, um, this like, you know, proletarian artist, um, and instead marries like a gangster. Um, and that does not end happily for her um, because he's... She doesn't realize that he's a gangster when, when she marries him. He, she's just like, this is a nice, rich guy who'll give me a really good life. But it turns out he's a gangster, and then he ends up embroiling the artist in his schemes. Uh, and the, the artist ends up making these sculptures that the gangster like hides hides drugs in. And um, it, it ends up as this like very weird combination of a screwball comedy and like a gangster film. Um, it's really good, but very strange. Uh, anyway, so Latif is from a working class background. <laughs> um, and, um, um, I'm not sure about Fakir Nabi. Uh, I actually, I, I'm, he, he trained at the Pune um, Institute in India. Um, which is like a technological institute that's known for training actors because he's mostly uh, like known as an actor. Um, and I think actors, it, it's again, it's like a mix. Some come from like a more like middle class, upper middle class background, and some come from like a more working class background. Uh, the community around Afghan films was like pretty open. Uh, uh, people who work there now, many of the people who work there now are the same people who worked there, um, uh, who worked there in the in the 80s, uh, who came back to to reopen it after the war. Uh, and um, you know, the government salaries in Afghanistan are very low. Um, so uh, anyone who works at Afghan films now would be considered to be very much like proletarian <laughs> because they're making very little money um, in, you know, it's, they're, they're living on like tiny, tiny salaries. Um, yeah. Um, uh, most of the, the people who work in things like film cutting, like negative cutting or who run, who are the a lot of women are, are editors there. Like most of the e editing department is, is run by women. Um, I think most of them uh, went to the uh, went through the film department at Kabul University, um, which was started in the in the in the seventies. Um, so and all of the younger people who work there now are are from come through the film department at Kabul University. Um, yeah, in the in the in the seventies you have. In the late, in the in the 80s, you have a group of filmmakers who trained here. Um, there's yeah, but yeah, that's that's there's just this small window when that happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to add something with regard to Indian film because you know Indian films are not just films with Raj Kapoor and in the 60s when Afghan filmmakers studied in India there was a school in Kolkata and Bollywood that always filmed blockbusters that we had, for example, in the Soviet Union for, for distribution. So uh, there are some uh, 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 filmmakers that are real, uh, you know, real representatives of film de terre. Uh, we can't really now find uh, any uh, um, uh, good uh, authors' films, uh, uh, Indian films, uh, because we only see commercial films. So you should dig deeper. It's not that easy. And uh, uh, that's why I wanted to say this. It's not that easy with regard to the influence of Indian film. I wanted to respond to my colleague. What's your name? Vladimir. I want to say that when we speak about the regime during Taraki and Amin, we say that this was a communist regime or pro-communist regime. Yes, you can say that. 
but I don't think you can actually call it a pro-communist regime because the idea is that they wanted to um, realize in the Afghan context, and we have seen what it was like, you know, these ruins, uh, poverty, um, houses like birds' nests. Of course, uh, uh, the, uh, there is no communist regime. There isn't any feudal regime. So the programs uh, uh, offered by PDPA was unreal. It was uh, too early uh, when this revolution happened. Uh, we were shocked. Uh, people in the Kremlin were shocked. And um, our ambassador, Puzanov, didn't even know that uh, there was this conspiracy against uh, uh, the uh, regime of Daoud. So this was a tragedy. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we lost uh, about 13,000 young boys there. And this uh, uh, generated lots of uh, problems for this country, lots of cracks. And this started with the uh, Russian troops sent to Afghanistan. So you can't do something good out of nothing. There's a new generation of filmmakers that are trying to create their film. And they will create something. They uh, will learn from our filmmakers and others. Uh, take a look at the Chinese filmmakers. Uh, you know, they just uh, uh, started with some revolutionary songs, but now, uh, you know, they made so many great dramas uh, that uh, were awarded with prizes at the international film festivals. So uh, the best of intelligentsia uh, is here in Moscow. Uh, they came here. Uh, no, but not only here, no, but to other countries as well. It's true that um, we have a Kabul government here, Afghanistan government everywhere, in the economics, in science, in the military work. But there's no reconciliation so far. So there's no, this, there's no flow that would take Afghan people out of uh, their dead uh, end. And uh, there are American uh, troops now. Of course, they will never let them go. They will uh, keep. Uh, them under their control, and so nothing progressive will be there. That's what we can see at the example of other regions. So these films that we have seen, and Maryam mentioned this word, microrayon. Microrayon is uh, what lamp was uh, here during Lenin's time. This was an appeal to start social transformations. I just wanted to ask about existing uh, construction. Uh, you know, they have beautiful uh, buildings. Yes, uh, Clifton embankment uh, um, uh, was developed and uh, uh, the buildings were constructed for rich people. But we meant uh, uh, massive construction. So the Soviet Union invested a lot of money and uh, helped uh, Afghan people uh, and 
the Soviet Union showed that they didn't have to live in that awful conditions when they had no portable water, nothing. Uh, uh, why don't we give the floor to Maryam? Uh, because you have uh, uh, made uh, quite a long statement, and I would like to ask Maryam to comment on that. And then maybe we could just, uh, you could just introduce the third film. And then afterwards, after uh, the third film, we can discuss everything, because I can see so many people that want to comment. Okay, so just to sort of wrap that up and then go into the next film. Um, we can just say that uh, from the period of Narusha up until, you know, 1970, 1978, Afghanistan really existed in the state that we called Bitarafi, which is um, non-alignment, but this peculiarly Afghan state of non-alignment, which is like to play both sides against the middle. So Afghanistan excelled in being a buffer state in trying to uh, get as much aid from the US as from the Soviet Union. And in the early days, it was from the UK as from <coughs> Russia. Um, and um, it, it, this was uh, how Afghanistan tried to maintain its independence while being caught between the great powers in the great game, right? Um, was to practice this philosophy of, uh, the political philosophy of bitarafi, um, you know, being both sided. Uh, uh, and Daoud himself was the one who really expressed this uh, in when he was prime minister, um, uh, in uh, in the uh, between uh, f 53 and 63, and he said, "I like to light my American cigarettes with a Russian match." Um, this is his like famous phrase, right? Encapsulating bitarafi. Um, so uh, yeah, that's 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 really the 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 essence of of the Afghan political state up until '78, and you know suddenly we're thrown out of Bitarafi, uh, and um, uh, you know the the coup of '78 uh, throws us into quite another uh, state. Um, if we want to give things the names that the um, the PDPA themselves gave them, they called it the People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. Um, and one of the things that's so fascinating about these films is that they show us a People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan that really only exists in these films. Um, it's a kind of idealized uh, like world, um, a, a sort of vision of what uh, the PDPA wanted Afghanistan to be that I, I, I really don't think existed anywhere except on film. Um, and uh, it's even more apparent in the finished films than in the unfinished ones, but we can also see it here. Um, uh, so uh, we're not going to see any films from after 87 uh, today, but if we were to look at those, you'll see a distinct shift, which re reflects the shift that happened after uh, Najib took power and changed the name of the country to the uh, Islamic Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, which it remains today, which you know is when the party also really shifted its em emphasis into trying to reconcile uh, Islam and communism, which is a very complicated and, uh, you know, somewhat paradoxical project. Um, so let's let's look at the third film, and uh, and see what it tells us about uh, Afghanistan in 1984. Um, and uh, I, I warn you that this this, as with the other things we've watched, this is. Um, you know, this is a this is scenes that I have assembled from partial rush prints. So we're never seeing the whole film here. Uh, so you have to make allowances for the fact that, you know, we're only seeing parts of these films, uh, and uh, it's it's my best guess as to how things might have gone together. <laughs> like, um, I'm I'm really just I'm just guessing in some of these cases. Um, yeah. So blame me, not the original filmmakers. Could you tell us the story, what this film is about, so that it was easier for us to understand? Right, yeah. So as, as best as I can guess, um, uh, The Black Diamond is about uh, a group of um, people who are involved in uh, trafficking, in smuggling. Um, uh, in support of the resistance against the regime. 
And um, what they are trafficking uh, seems to be uh, possibly diamonds from the title, although we never see any diamonds. Um, definitely uh, uh, some kind of information because they have uh, photographs and, and uh, microfiche. Um, also, uh, they are making, uh, they're manufacturing passports for people who want to flee the country. Uh, and you'll, you'll see a bit of that operation later. That, that uh, operation is based out of a hair salon, uh, which was like quite a common um, kind of base of operations for that sort of, uh, um, that sort of project. Because, you know, people could come in like, uh, dye their hair like wigs or and get a photograph taken and it could all be done out of the back room of a hair salon like very practically uh, this is the daughter the rebellious daughter of one of the traffickers uh, for the family subplot of the film um, which you know turns around this rebellious daughter uh, and the artist who was painting her uh, is in love with her and wants to court her um, but uh, again, this seems to be a common kind of thread in some of the Afghan films of this time. Like the family doesn't think the artist is good enough. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's like the autobiographical thing that happens in all of these, like these films, like the artist is never good enough for the daughter. Um, yeah. So this, this guy is the main, um, Protagonist, and he's uh, he's played by uh, Nuroshan Abir, who's actually um, he uh, was the cameraman on uh, he was the cameraman on the film we just watched. So <laughs> it really is a, like a small family of people making these films. And you might also recognize uh, the daughter who played the wife in the film we just watched. So it's an actress named Ferida. So we are trying to see the film and we are continuing our discussion. So if you have any comments, please raise your hands. Hello, my name is Izatula Husseini. I'm, uh, I have a PhD in philology. I work at the company uh, Russia Today. I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me to come here. I like this um, uh, event very much. Uh, I, you know, Afghanistan uh, has never been uh, um, a communist uh, state or um, a democratic state. And my uh, question is for Alexander Markov and Mariam Kani. There is Afghan diaspora here in Moscow, and there's attaché for culture working at the embassy of Afghanistan. I guess they have not been invited to come here because I don't see them here, right? So I'm just curious about this. Because the only person from Afghanistan is myself, because I don't see anyone else. No, there are others. Well, very good then. I'm happy. So, uh, you said that there was some influence of Indian films on Afghan film or European films. Well, I guess, uh, you know, it's the same as with the state of Afghanistan. Uh, I can mention, uh, for example, Humayun Muruvat. Um, um, two of his films were shown here, A Flight Without Wings and uh, The Apple of Paradise. So, well, I watch these films as history. Uh, 
history of film in Afghanistan, because I don't see anything else. Because, you know, these films are silent, so I don't uh, hear any dialogues. So I'm just watching uh, these images. I can't say much. Maybe uh, this is just a historical film, you know, a film about Afghanistan. That's all I can say. Because, you know, we don't know what it's all about. Yeah. Hello, Mariam. I, my name is Sorab. I think, do you remember me? We already met in New York, Albany. Right. At your, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember you were talking a little bit about your um, project that you were casting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first film I saw, you colorized the movie. I mean, the film was colorized. And the other second film, and this mm -hmm. film is uh, still in black and white. And mm -hmm. as I heard you told that uh, you, you were sending this movie to Uzbekistan for colorization, right? Well, that's what they did at the time. They sent, uh, uh, Afghan films would send uh, their negatives to Uzbekistan for processing if they were color negatives because they didn't have a, a color film processor in Afghanistan. Uh, and actually, there's still no no processor for color 35 millimeter film negatives in Afghanistan. So they've always had to be sent outside the country to be yeah. processed. Yeah. yeah, I see. Um, why mm -hmm. didn't you try do, to do that in United States or maybe in India? Because as I know, as I know, you have a lot of friends in, in Indian guys. I well, think. it's not that I did it. It's that um, the, fil the, it, the filmmakers did that at the time that the films okay. were made. So right now we're just trying to find the negatives that were sent there to Uzbekistan in the 1980s um, and didn't come back. Uh, so actually Garage has been helping me try to find uh, these negatives because uh, Uzbek film was kind of was disbanded um, uh, uh, and it doesn't actually exist anymore um, as far as I know. So it's actually been quite complicated to try to find out what might have happened uh, to, these, to these negatives in Uzbekistan if they might still be there, I'm not sure. Um, so, of course, first we looked for them here to see if they, uh, if a copy had been sent to Goso Film Fund, um, but it doesn't look like that happened. So we're now looking, you know, we're still looking in Tashkent. Um, and uh, you, actually, I was working on that today with Yegor, um, and uh, we're, we're, we're tracking down some new leads. Um, but... Um, you're right. It, it, at other periods in history, um, uh, the negatives were actually sent to Chennai. So it's only between 1978 and 1987, or yeah, it's only between 1978 and 1987 that the negatives were sent to, to Tashkent to be processed. That's <coughs> the only time when that happened. Otherwise, they were sent to Chennai. Right. Yeah, that mm -hmm. would be great if someone will taking care about Mm. that to make colorized all these movies mm. because it, they are really good memorials for us. Mm. Um, so as I was growing at Mikaran, at first mm. Mikaran, mm. and I was uh, seeing the second movies, mm. I can approve, yeah, I remember I, w I was maybe five year old and every morning mm. my and my father, we were going for tennis, playing tennis. Yeah. Sometimes in weekends they were playing golf. <laughs> yeah, and mm. I think uh, yeah, I, I heard different opinions here, but uh, so is my experience, my life experience. I can mm -hmm. approve that. <laughs> yeah, the Western style of uh, lifestyle in Mekran, especially in first Mekran. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about all Kabul or yeah, uh, yeah. other cities, but in first Mekran, it was true. Yeah, we had like, you know, our Toyota cars mm -hmm. <laughs> with automatic windows. <laughs> and I remember uh, we had some Russian neighbors in our uh, house in First Mikrayan. Mm -hmm. For them, that technology was something new, mm -hmm. of course, because uh, Soviet Union that time, that period was closed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 
just this movie is remind, reminding me of my childhood. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you very much. And it's great pleasure to see you to do this great job for Afghan people and for Afghan movies. Thank you. Thank you. Мне бы хотелось задать вопрос по поводу... I'd like to ask you about the film that we are now watching. I have seen this film already and I was intrigued by the scene uh, when we see this like public committee of women. It was just several uh, minutes ago, maybe three minutes ago, when one of the female characters uh, uh, came. Uh, it's not quite clear whether she was trying to uh, inform on on, uh, her relative or on her friend who began uh, to get involved uh, with the smugglers. So what kind of uh, event was it and what was the end? So what kind of uh, committee it was as far as I understood it? Well, as far as I understand it, it's more like a, a parent-teacher conference. Uh, like the, the older woman is the headmistress of the school. Uh, she's the, the school director. Uh, and then the second woman at the desk like, is the secretary, the school secretary. Uh, and the, the rebellious daughter has done something bad in school. Um, and uh, this woman, who is her older sister, I believe, um, is, uh, has been called in uh, to be told about what, you know, the bad behavior of this girl in school. Um, and is, you know, they're, they're sort of being read a whole lecture um, about you know how this girl is like really not a not a doctor like not a good girl, um, so uh, that that was my interpretation of the scene um, was that it's part of the part of the family subplot um, that has to do with the rebellious daughter, the the daughter who is really defying the the kind of social norms um, of 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 the time um, or like trying to move from the social norms of an earlier time to the social norms of the time that's coming uh, in a way yeah то есть она пришла туда то есть она пришла туда не по своей воле so she came there uh, she was made to come there she was made right so she was forced to go there right yeah, I think the, the sister, I interpret her as a sister, uh, is, is asked to come into the school. And there's like an interesting scene just before that where you see at the gate of the school um, how everyone who comes into the school has to have, has to go through like basically a checkpoint um, where their bags are searched. Um, and, uh, you know, that was very typical at the time, like schools were under very tight security because they were targeted. Um, uh, like girls schools especially were, were targeted apparently. Um, and so, yeah, everyone who's coming into the school in that scene is having their, their bags searched. Uh, yeah, so this is this fun little scene where everyone's uh, having a dance party. Um, yeah, to like a Bollywood movie on the television. Mm. And I guess uh, a sub motive of this film, uh, um, you probably noticed that there are many, you know, sub motives. Could you tell us more about this? For example, speaking about this uh, sub motive. I think there are quite many scenes with television, and television broadcasts some mass culture, some entertainment, and uh, in the end there is a tragic end, which is also related related to television that is going to be smashed. Sorry to spoil your uh, pleasure, but there is this motive. So is this an intention? Uh, and could could you tell us about other motives or sub motives in this? Film. Right. So, so yeah, there's uh, there is this kind of uh, little motif running through with uh, uh, the televisions being watched uh, constantly in the film, uh, and they're like transmitting uh, these vectors of of this uh, Western culture and mass culture um, into the into this uh, family 
family circle, um, this circle of older values that are being infected by these new values. Um, and uh, in the, um, like in the kind of climactic uh, scenes of the film, uh, when the police come to raid the house uh, of, uh, of one of, the, the police come and raid all the houses of the traffickers, uh, and in one of them they actually dismantle a television set and find inside it uh, the radio apparatus that the traffickers have been using to signal, uh, to signal the resistance. Like, so <laughs> the, the television is like really positioned as this vector of like bad things, <laughs> like um, <laughs> things you, you shouldn't be doing. Um, yeah. <laughs> So speaking about other motives, um, uh, like so, these uh, smugglers or trafficking, what uh, uh, what do they do? So uh, we mentioned passports that uh, they make. Uh, could you tell us more about this? Right. So the 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 little subplot about the passports that they're manufacturing, um, it seems to connect to. Uh, a theme that was present in several films from this period, um, which is about um, uh, the, 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 the regime was basically encouraging filmmakers to, to put this theme into films, um, uh, showing the, um, that when people, uh, intellectuals flee uh, the country, bad things happen to them or when they attempt to flee the country, bad things will happen to them. So this is the main theme of uh, two of Latif Ahmadi's uh, films from the 80s, uh, which is uh, Farrar, Escape, and um, Immigrant Birds, um, both of which show people, you know, the, the, the terrible hardships of the journeys that people take when they're trying to flee Afghanistan, like trying to flee their, their you know, lives as intellectuals in Kabul. Um, and it's really like meant to kind of try to, to stop this great loss of like uh, of the intellectual class that was actually fleeing, um, you know, fleeing uh, those who could afford to, who were fleeing uh, the country at the time. Uh, and the, the kind of irony of having this theme present in this particular film is that the reason this film was never finished is that Khaled Khalil left the country before he finished it. So, <laughs> <laughs> he went to Kiev and he never came back. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that. That is a delicious irony. <laughs> it's obvious uh, that uh, this is. Uh, uh, the best uh, film uh, uh, out of three because it's uh, it has a very good structure and uh, then uh, it's uh, very interesting to see how the film director is uh, looking for a right genre and uh, um, uh, it can be uh, some moral story but this scene with television is amazing and it's obvious uh, that uh, the director absorbed uh, the film, the international film culture, because there are so angles, uh, uh, and uh, it uh, reminded me of Italian neorealism. Uh, so this film uh, uh, shows brilliantly that the film uh, director uh, knew very good films. And um, uh, speaking about, uh, um, you know, some moral uh, points, uh, there are uh, many examples in the Soviet films, but it's a good film. I'd love to uh, say that I'm watching this film for the first time and I'm really interested in this film. Even though we don't hear any sound, you can understand what happens uh, just uh, uh, based on what the actors do, based on their face expressions and mimics. And uh, I, I would say this is a family drama with a tragic ending. 
and uh, also the tra tragedy of uh, intellectuals that could not accept revolution, that could not understand uh, what kind of society they were trying to build. Uh, and they uh, were related with Western values. So, uh, uh, so many gifted people flee the country. And uh, I know now that um, uh, there are so many Afghan writers that live in Canada and in Germany. And um, Mm. Uh, many people uh, first came here to Russia, uh, you know, got married, had their families, but then they went to the West. So I guess they had these uh, connections with the West. And uh, if only uh, this film had sound, I think it would make a very good impression on the viewers. Mariam, um, uh, so what do you think about this distance? It was a very uh, short distance between 78 and 1984 to rethink uh, um, uh, the revolution because uh, a film, uh, you know, needs like 15 years in order to reflect on something that happened in the past, at least um, in this country. Uh, so do you agree with Ludmila that young people portrayed in this film are the uh, people of revolution? Because I have a different feeling. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think the, the people portrayed in this film are necessarily those, those people. I think in a way they're, um, they're much more like the undecided. Yeah, it's much more a film about the undecided. There's actually a scene in this film where uh, you, it's set in, in a scene set in a movie theater uh, where uh, you see the audience watching uh, a newsreel uh, about, um, uh, about uh, fighting uh, in the provinces. Uh, and uh, you see uh, like one of the young girls who is in that party scene. Um, and you see her watching this newsreel of like this, these kind of violent uh, uh, clashes in the provinces, and you see like you see her uh, reaction to it. Uh, and you, I think we're meant to interpret it as her, you know, suddenly understanding the stakes. Uh, this is the scene I'm talking about. It's like. It's very murky, the footage, but basically this is supposed to be what she's seeing on the screen, which is a newsreel of you know this clash going on in the provinces, and these are the people watching it in the theater. Um, and she has kind of a strong reaction to it, and I think we're meant to interpret it as her understanding for the first time the actual stakes of what she's involved with, that you know what she's gotten involved with actually has uh, costs in like real human lives, um, which she has never considered before because she is not politically engaged. She's not a politically engaged person. Um, and we're, I think we're meant to read that as a moment when, like the first moment when she actually even thinks about that. Like um, she's never thought about it before. I don't think these are meant to be read as politically engaged people and I think that's we're supposed to see that as, in a way, their tragedy. Like, that they don't, they're not engaged, they don't understand the stakes. Yeah. And, and the distance? Hmm. Oh, yeah, the distance, like, um, it's, not, it's not very long. Um, and I think a lot uh, changes uh, during those years. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's uh, like, the. the from 78, uh, when we were looking at the film, um, The April Revolution in 78, that's like such a different moment um, when there's a lot of optimism uh, and a lot of hope uh, in, in you know, what this particular uh, change can accomplish. And I think by 84, actually, there's, there's much more cynicism um, and there's, uh, there's uh, the resistance has gathered so much more strength by 1984 um, after the failed land reforms um, and after, you know, the decree about women also. Um, so there's, uh, 
there's a very different feeling. Um, uh, the cities are much more like islands. Um, like islands, the regime is functioning like little in these little city islands surrounded by uh, conflicts, right? Surrounded, so they're they're like besieged, right? Um, so it's it's very very different from seventy eight. Yes, there are comments in the hall, please. Yes, good evening. Um, I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one was perhaps addressed at the beginning of the talk, because I maybe missed it, um, came a little later, or maybe I missed it during. But where exactly were, was this footage collected from, and when was it compiled? And the second question I have is an ethnic one. Um, I am aware that there are certain ethnic or slight cultural differences between the Pashtuns, Tajiks, and other ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And uh, I was wondering whether there was any way um, in which these differences are addressed in Afghan film of the 70s. And as a matter of fact, um, which language, Pashto or Dari, were these films originally meant to be voiced in? Thank you very much. Uh, so this footage uh, was found at the Afghan Films Archive uh, in Kabul. Uh, so the, the uh, April Revolution footage was actually, um, the, the footage that we saw was actually digitized in the 90s during a, a French, a very brief French telecine project. Um, but, you know, it... It didn't last very long because the machine they brought was very old and it broke almost immediately, um, which is, you know, <laughs> go Ina. Um, and then um, uh, there's the, the other footage um, came from Rush Prints, uh, uh, which uh, uh, I found, um, uh, I went looking for and I found uh, after I heard about these unfinished films. Um, and then uh, they, were, they were digitized for me in the sense that they were filmed off the screen of a Steenbeck with a Canon 5D. Um, so <laughs> they're, they're not really like, they're, it's a very kind of low res situation. Um, so you found them in yeah, yeah, they were found at Afghan Films at the archive. Um, they were on a, a shelf in a room that hadn't been, where the reels hadn't been recataloged yet. They've been re, they had been recataloging the archive, but they hadn't gotten to that room yet. Uh, and they were covered in dust. They hadn't been opened since they were first printed. Um, so yeah, that's where you know these last two films, the footage came from. Uh, in terms of language, these uh, films were originally scripted in Dari. Uh, uh, most feature films were um, of, at the time were scripted in Dari. Uh, the um, uh, newsreels that were distributed before, like Afghan films made weekly newsreels that were um, played in the in the cinemas before the films, and those were almost always done with um, uh, produced with alternate language narrations. So they would have Pashto um, for cinemas uh, in Pashto uh, majority provinces, and they would sometimes also make an Uzbek version. Um, for uh, some Uzbek uh, majority uh, areas. Um, but there would almost always be a, a Pashto and a Dari version of all the newsreels. But I, I don't know of any case where that was done for a feature film. Take a look at this scene, uh, tra tragic end. We mentioned that, so they are poisoned. Yes, so um, it's very common for everyone to die at the end of an Afghan film, uh, especially if uh, they it's if they're criminals or have done something immoral. Um, the the most common punishment for that in Afghan cinema is death. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, Afghans love a good tragedy. It's uh, yeah. 
Salam, Ms. Mariam. Uh, my name is Rahim Allah. I'm the student of civil engineering in the People Friendship University of Russia. Um, I would like to ask you a question that uh, what was your mission uh, behind these films? Uh, can you just tell me in one, two sentences? Okay, yeah, I uh, became interested in these films uh, because I'm interested in uh, the idea of unfinished projects from this time. Uh, and I think there are multiple unfinished projects that they represent. So there's the unfinished artistic projects. There's also several unfinished political projects from this time. And the one that's the most relevant, I think, to now um, is like the unfinished project of reconciliation, um, you know, which is like Najib's great project of the last, you know, of, of 87 to 92 is this, this project of reconciliation, which really doesn't get finished. Um, and uh, the, the film Kajra, which we didn't uh, watch uh, today, which is Crooked Path or Wrong Way, um, is another unfinished film. It's from 1991 by Juan Sher Haidari, but that is really a film about reconciliation. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, it's a good example of like, in the way in which these films can sort of bring up these these ideas, uh, I think that that's that's one part of it. Another part is that it's a way into a series of conversations about Afghan histories that don't get talked about very much. Um, and you know, the history of the Afghan left is a history that we don't talk about very much in Afghanistan, and we don't talk about it very much outside Afghanistan because people outside Afghanistan don't know that it exists, right? <laughs> like they don't know that like there's a history of Afghan modernism, like there's a history of Afghan intellectualism, there's a history of an Afghan left that dates back like to the 1950s, um, you know, and Awakened Youth and the Salonik Bad in Kandahar and, you know, there's all these other histories of Afghanistan that, um, uh, people almost never talk about uh, because there's like one narrative of Afghanistan that dominates the conversation about Afghanistan and that's you know the story of the Civil War um, which is like this tiny little slice of our history it's like this tiny tiny slice of our, our history um, and it's all anyone ever talks about and that's very frustrating <laughs> like you know so I think you know I became interested in these films because they're you know, a way into all these other conversations about uh, other dreams of Afghanistan that people have dreamed in the past, you know, dreams about other Afghanistans that could have existed. Um, it, certainly the, the dream of, uh, of uh, the, the PDPA did not come to be in any way that was positive like it didn't work you know it, it wasn't it wasn't really a good thing as realized in in like life um, but you know it's instructive to think about alternative possibilities um, and other dreams that you know happened at other points in our history um, so uh, that's 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 all. Okay, I, and I think until you did not re uh, release it, yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think until you did not release the, uh, these films, mm -hmm. it's your personal directly. Mm -hmm. Did you release these films? Uh, um, I I can't release these films because they're not my films. Uh, they're actually the they're. They're, they belong to the filmmakers, the original filmmakers, um, and they belong. The copyright actually belongs to Afghan Films, to the the State Film Institute in in Afghanistan. So Afghan Films has given me permission uh, to screen them, and um, whenever I do like a, a a public screening, not a sort of more closed one like this, you know, Afghan Films get gets paid a fee. Um, you know, they get paid a fee for a screening. Uh, uh, I am planning to make a film using some of this footage. Um, 
using footage from these films and also using interviews with, with all the filmmakers who are still alive. Uh, and for that, I will release, I will release that film and I will, you know, have paid a licensing fee to the archive at that point, you know. Um, but uh, it's, it's an important part of this project to uh, really be in conversation with the archive and with the original filmmakers about the use that I make of the films. Because, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, they're not mine. Okay. Like, they're, they actually belong to these other people. Okay, I got um, it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Просто возьмем тоже две, два сравнения. I had two observations uh, related to this unfinished uh, films. Uh, you know, uh, speaking about Soviet films, there are so many uh, unfinished films, uh, and um, they were censored a lot, and many uh, film directors hate thinking about them. Let's say, uh, you know, a film director invested lots of time and money, but then he didn't finish it, uh, or something happened, and they hate thinking about those films. Just leave it. Um, it hasn't been completed. It's a rule. They don't like it. Uh, they don't like, uh, you know, to, to remember about that time. Karen, uh, who is teaching in St. Petersburg, I don't remember his last name. He uh, made this film about dog, Peggy Pierce. So I asked uh, um, uh, him to show me the film, but he said, no, I don't want to see it. I haven't finished it, so I don't want to see it. Ну это понятно, если ты его как-то доделываешь, если что, то вообще не очень любит. But we like it. We uh, researchers are interested in seeing that uh, film. But uh, it's very important to mention. And another point, um, you know, these films that uh, I have seen now, uh, they remind me of family uh, chronics, chronicles. You know, sometimes when we see this um, uh, family uh, um, uh, films, uh, they yeah. usually yeah. unfinished, yeah. and yeah. you can use these uh, uh, films to study the history of your country. Just, uh, it was uh, a very good um, uh, uh, observation that, you know, uh, this film makes me think about my childhood, and the same is true about myself. When I see some fragments um, uh, filmed by my parents, so it's a very important important uh, source of memory. And you don't know uh, what you're going to discover in a finished film or in an unfinished film. Sometimes just a couple of stills uh, are enough uh, for you to remember lots of things. Gennady and Ludmila, perhaps you could make um, a short conclusion because we're running out of time. I should say that today's meeting has been very useful Afghanistan, no matter how tragic the situation is, is still alive. Afghanistan is living in very unnatural uh, conditions and is trying to advance and, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, these films uh, are a sign of uh, masterfulness and uh, it um, can be used mm, by specialists, and we can see um, that uh, uh, it was a good start, and um, I think that uh, it uh, could be developed further. And um, I'd love to thank uh, Mariam Ghani for her work, for her hard work. Uh, it's like a preacher's work because she is trying to get this message across uh, uh, that uh, 
Афган фильм «Изалайв» и имеет очень светлый будущий для развития. I would also like uh, to join uh, many things that have been told today. Mariam has opened a new page for us and have shown the films that we would never be able to see anywhere. And uh, uh, she protects um, cultural heritage. Uh, and um, sometimes this um, heritage cannot be accessible uh, for many people. And we have seen some history, family uh, stories, you know, tragedy that Afghan people uh, has lived through. And I think um, she does a lot of enlightenment because uh, it's a uh, huge work when she works with uh, filmmakers, uh, when she works with archives, especially like Alexander said that many people don't like to think about the history, about the past, but uh, uh, it's very important to know the history which is reflected in art, in culture, in literature, in film. And uh, it's important uh, for all people, not only uh, people that live in Afghanistan. Uh, we are here, uh, have a very small audience, but maybe when Maria Ghani uh, gets to know the Afghan diaspora, they might do something else uh, together just to make sure it has as broad coverage as possible. And I would like to thank all uh, the organizers of events and uh, uh, all the uh, viewers uh, who came here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariam. I think uh, that this event proves uh, that film is very closely connected to history, that film can be political, just like culture, and uh, uh, there is very close connection between these uh, political processes. Uh, we would like to thank you, Mariam, but if you want to add something, you're welcome. Well, I'll just leave it there and say thank you all very much.